Um, this is the 34th annual winter lecture series, the um, title of which is Imagining a Just World Order. We partner with Ollie and with uh, Humanities Nebraska, who offers us financial support. Uh, the main sponsor of this program is the Social Action Committee of the Unitarian Church. Uh, the lectures and panel discussion are uh, put on to the web, and uh, you can find them at www.unitarianlincoln, all one word, of course, dot org. Uh, typically, um, they come in about a week or so after each Sunday. So if you've missed any and you feel like you need to go back, that's where you go. You know by now that... Um, that uh, refreshments are available at the break, that we will give you 10 or 15 minutes after the lecture for uh, taking uh, advantage of those uh, refreshments. Remember that if you have a loose cash and are wondering uh, where it might wander, one of the places to allow it to wander is into the little contribution uh, baskets with the, uh, the refreshments because that money actually just goes to support winter lecture series in the future. Uh, remember also that on pain of uh, some sort of thing, I don't remember, uh, you can't bring uh, cups back in here after you sup your coffee and so forth. Hearing assistance is available. Um, the, they actually work. We've had some reports at first that um, they weren't working, but we've discovered some things to make them work. Uh, please silence your cell phones. I have two announcements about groups that are out in the room where you get your refreshments. The first is the Nebraska Conservation, Conservation Education Fund is doing um, a survey about essentially uh, conservation-related issues. They're, in, they're at the table that is closest to the, to the doorway here. To not the outside doorway, but the interior doorway. Uh, during break, um, take advantage of visiting them and uh, leaving um, a survey filled out. Also, volunteers with the bipartisan Citizens Climate Lobby, which I'm sure many of you know lots about, uh, are at the table, this, the table that's not closest to the doorways over here, but furthest from the doorways. Um, they encourage you to fill out one of the, <coughs> excuse me, constituent consent forms found there to voice your concern about climate change. They'll make three copies of your comments and hand deliver them to the offices of our members of Congress. So this is not something where you just check things off, but actually uh, write some notes. Peter Levitoff will introduce today's speaker. Hi, it's Mike. Uh, you, if you've gotten the advanced materials, uh, you have noticed that the speaker who's slated to speak tonight is Don Wilhite, who many of you know. Uh, due to a very urgent personal family matter, he's had to be out of town, uh, but he's provided us with uh, a longtime colleague, actually his successor as the director of the Drought Mitigation Center, uh, Center so you won't be disappointed uh, in Don not being here. Uh, Mike Hayes, Michael Hayes, uh, has a bachelor's degree uh, in meteorology from the University of Wisconsin and a master's from the same university in atmospheric sciences. Uh, he earned his doctorate in atmospheric sciences from the University of Missouri in Columbia. Uh, he came to uh, UNL Shortly after he completed his PhD in 1995, he came as a climate impact specialist with the National Drought Mitigation Ceremony, which Don Wilhite had fairly recently founded and was the director of at that time. <clears throat> uh, Mike has worked uh, on projects around the world uh, in this area, including working in the Horn of Africa, in the Caribbean, and in North Africa. Uh, after about 10 years uh, with the Drought Mitigation Center, 
uh, Don Wilhite was asked to step over and become the head of the new School of Natural Resources, and Mike was the heir apparent and became the director of that center in uh, <clears throat> 2007. Uh, while at the center, uh, he studied uh, drought risk management, disaster management, extreme events, drought planning and adaptation, climate variability, the effects on climate on human activities and the inverse, the effects on human activities on climate and on water-related issues. Uh, he's published more than 50 scientific articles, book chapters, and technical reports, has presented scores of papers at professional conferences both in the United States and abroad, and has advised foreign governments and international agencies in the area. Um, <clears throat> at the university, uh, about a year or two ago, uh, Mike stepped down from being the director of the center, and uh, he's a professor in the School of Natural Resources, uh, specializing in, uh, in climate areas. Uh, he's a, an applied climatologist. He's part of the newly created Applied Climate and Spatial Science mission of the School of Natural Resources. Um, while in that role, he also is affiliated with the UNL Water for Food Institute and on a very interesting joint project with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, known as the U.S. Drought Monitor. And if you go online every week, that organization produces a drought map of the United States uh, showing the changes that take place from week to week with, with predictive uh, graphs as well. Um, tonight's topic is the same topic that, uh, that Don was going to speak on, sustainable development and uh, environmental stressors and resilience. Uh, this sounds like a dismal topic to some of us because we know what's going on with, with, uh, with climate and drought, but this is a positive take on things. Remember, this is imagining a just world order, not imagining the reverse. So, uh, but uh, Mike is going to speak about the challenge of achieving responsible economic growth in light of current and future environmental stressors, that is climate change, drought, water scarcity, given the implications of these stressors on food security, national and regional conflicts, and environmental refugees. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Michael Hayes. Thank you, Peter, for that excellent introduction. Um, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the rain caught me off guard, so I appreciate you guys coming in uh, through the rain to come here tonight. You've heard the expression, as embarrassed as a wet meteorologist. Well, <laughs> that's me tonight, right? Uh, or as I leave, maybe. Um, so yeah, the rain caught me off guard. So uh, Peter did a great job in, in talking about the kind of the original intent of this uh, lecture tonight, and that Don Wilhite was going to be here. And I know Don is very sorry to not be here tonight. He would have loved to have been here and made this presentation and uh, presented this lecture. So he's very sorry not to be here uh, tonight. Um, I kept the same topic and the same title, but I'll have a slightly different take than what Don would have had in his presentation. So it'll, it'll be a little bit different. Um, I'll also take some materials that I use in uh, the class, classes that I teach, and I'm teaching one class this semester called Climate and Society, and so I, I have the students, um, they kind of go through some of these topics that we'll be talking about today, and so I'll bring in some of the points that I raise with my students uh, in that class as part of the lecture tonight. So let's begin. So one of the things I have my students do right from the very beginning is they read this article that Don Wubbles wrote in uh, EOS, a journal EOS, in December of 2012. 
And what he was doing in that article was he was commemorating the 40 year anniversary of this photo that was taken by Apollo 17 of the blue marble of Earth, and um, which was done in, in December of 1972. And so one of the things that I have my students do is this article has a series of quotes from people that are associated with this photograph. And I have my students kind of reflect back on what that quote means to them as they look at this photograph, this picture, and uh, go through this quote. So I'm gonna have you guys do the same thing. I'm gonna show the four quotes up here and imagine this picture associated with the four quotes. So quote one, and I'm gonna turn here so I can read it as well. I'll read it aloud. If somebody said before the flight, are you going to get carried away looking at the earth from the moon? I would have said, no way. But when I first looked back at the earth, standing on the moon, I cried. Astronaut Alan Shepard. Just think about that for a moment. That's one perspective. Here's a second quote. When you go around the earth in an hour and a half, you begin to recognize that your identity is with the whole thing. And that makes a change. And from where you see it, the thing is a whole. The earth is a whole. And it's so beautiful. Astronaut Russell Scheichardt. Quote three, a stunning revelation. Its thin film of life was far thinner and far more vulnerable than anybody had ever imagined. Ecologist Donald Worcester. And then the last quote. The information gained from seeing from the outside our azure green planet in all its global beauty has given rise to a whole new set of questions and answers. Atmospheric chemist James Lovelock. So as I think about those quotes, four things come to my mind. Um, the first is that I have trouble believing that it's only been 46 years since we've been able to see the Earth from this perspective. Now the students in my class, they've grown up and they, this is just kind of a, a given to them, right? This perspective. And for me, I kind of came in right at the transition period. Uh, I was before this photograph, but it, uh, I probably didn't appreciate what this photograph meant. And then there are probably some of you here in the audience where this photograph actually did make a huge impact on you um, at some point in, in your life. So that's really an interesting thought that we've only had 46 years to really think about the Earth from this perspective. The second thought is these quotes just captivate me. I find myself just year after year when I'm teaching this class, just kind of being caught up in these quotes and I think about them and I think about them. It's just, it, it's just amazing when you look at that picture and, and maybe I could be as articulate as they were. <laughs> um, the third thing is that I find that I'm almost hungry to hear how my students reflect upon these quotes. And so, one of my favorite parts of the class, the whole semester, is hearing their perspective on the take of these quotes and what they think about these quotes. It, it's it's a, an amazing thing. It's very inspirational to hear what the students think about these quotes. And then the fourth point that comes to my mind is that as an evangelical Christian, these quotes in this picture have really challenged my view on creation, on justice, and on heaven. And so it, I think it's a really interesting perspective. And if we all had this perspective in mind as we thought about some of the issues that are going on in, in the 
uh, around the world today. I think it might perhaps help um, get us through some of these challenges that we face. And we do face a lot of challenges. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start with the challenges. And then as Peter said, you know, we're moving on to hopefully some positives that I can talk about as I get toward the end of the lecture. So where to begin? Well, let's begin with the, 200, or the 2018 World Economic Forum. It's held every year in Davos, Switzerland. Uh, President Trump was there this year. Uh, Prime Minister May of, of Great Britain, I think Putin was there. Um, they all come there. Um, every year associated with this meeting is a report that's put out called the Global Risk Report. And what they do is they survey about a thousand respondents around the globe about what they think are the biggest issues that face the earth in the next 10 years. So these are really the top thousand economic experts around the globe. And so their perspective on what the Earth is facing in the next 10 years is always very interesting. So these are the top five risks in terms of global impact that come up from these 1,000 uh, experts around the world. And uh, um, on the right there, you can't see it, but that's 2018. So that's this year's top five challenges. The top one is weapons of mass destruction then extreme weather events, natural disasters, failure of climate change, mitigation and adaptation, and then water crises. The colors, if you can make them out, represent categories, economic, geopolitical, environmental, societal, and technological. So those are the top five, and that was 2018. In uh, 2008, um, it was asset price collapse, uh, retrenchment from globalization, slowing Chinese economy, oil and gas price hike, and pandemics. Very different impacts in 2008 than what we're fearing or what these experts are fearing in 2018. In fact, that box around there highlights four of the five are natural resource related uh, worries that they have, the extreme weather events, natural disasters, climate change, and water crises. Three of them are environmental, one's classified as societal, but it's really a natural resource related issue. Only on the other side in 2008, there were mainly economic issues that we're facing, that, and we were in an economic situation back in 2008, if you remember, so that makes sense that there were worries back then about the economies around the world. But it's very interesting how this has transitioned to a natural resource related worry that these experts have in 2018. So this next slide, if it had worked out well, I would have shown a website that exists at the World Economic Forum. So if you're interested, you can go to the World Economic Forum and you can get onto this website. And what it does is it takes those thousand experts that I mentioned and it breaks them down country by country. And so you can actually see the, the worries of these experts based on whether they're from the United States, from Canada, from Germany, Russia, China, Africa, um, Southern America, South America. And what's really interesting is you see that these experts in different parts of the world worry about completely different things. And so that's really fascinating to look at. In the US, we're very worried about terrorism and cyber attacks. In China, they're very worried about natural disasters was their top worry. Uh, that was also the top worry in New Zealand and Chile. So that's kind of an interesting partnership. So what's happening, what's pulling up is there's the globe, or <laughs> you can't see the, the, the um, countries are there, and then what their ranks are for each issue is there on, uh, on the bottom. And then as you click each country, if you were to do that, and you don't have to do that, Shrad, we can, uh, 
we'll, we'll move on after that, but thanks. Um, the, it shifts so that the worries that for each country come up and you can see the perspective for each country. So yeah, you click on China, there's natural uh, catastrophes comes up as their top worry. And if you, know, if you get it on the page where you can see all of them, it's, it's really cool. <laughs> this is probably not the coolest one, but terrorist attacks is, is the top worry of the economists in, in the United States. Hank Shred. And Shred, I'll have one more connection like that and a few slides too, so uh, um, if you help me out. Ooh. I think you might need to help me out there, Shred. You want me to forward it myself? There we go. Sorry about that. Don't get dizzy. So here we are in uh, 2018, but 2017 was an amazing year when you look at it from a meteorologist perspective, um, a worrying year from other perspectives, certainly. This graph here shows the number of natural disaster loss events from 1980 to 2017, so 37 years. And the source of this data is Munich Re. They're a reinsurance uh, company in Europe. Reinsurance companies are the companies that insure the insurance companies. So they're very interested in disaster losses. And so um, here on the left, that's 1980, and here on the right is 2017 and the number of disasters that have occurred. And the red color disasters, if you can see that, are geophysical. And there really is no trend in the geophysical disasters that have occurred over those 37 years. The green are meteorological events, and there is a trend going up. The blue are hydrological events. And then the orange yellow are climatological events. Overall, the number of events is going up. We're over 700 in the last couple of years compared to I think this is about 200 here on the far left here. So definitely there's this increase in uh, natural disaster events that is occurring in, uh, around the globe. And two 2017 was part of that same trend. So this table shows similar information, natural disaster losses, but just for 2017, well, this is 2017 here in this column. The second column is 2016. The third is a 10-year average. And the fourth is a 30-year average. Again, this is from Munich Re. For 2017, there were 710 events compared to 780 in 2016. 605 is the 10-year average. 490 is the 30-year average. Dollar amounts in U.S. dollars, $330 billion in 2017. That was about double 2016, double the 10-year average, and the 30-year average is about $130 billion. Insured losses is about a third of what total losses are. And then you see fatalities as the bottom row, 10,000 in 2017 just under 10,000 in 2016. The 10-year average was 60,000, and the 30-year average was 53,000. So in 2016 and 2017, we actually had far fewer fatalities from these events than we had in the long-term averages. And this is just a list of those, the top 10 natural disasters of 2017. The key point is the top three are Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Maria, and then the fourth one is wildfire in the western United States. So um, if you look at this column, overall losses, $85 billion for Hurricane Harvey, uh, $67 billion for Hurricane Irma, $63 billion for Hurricane Maria. So huge, 10 billion for the wildfire in, in 
the Western US. Um, insured loss is about a third of that again. And uh, fatalities, not many fatalities. There was flooding in South Asia, about 2,700 fatalities. But mainly these were big events that caused lots of damage and lots of economic losses. This graph shows a comparison of lost totals from 1980 to 2017. The green are the total, so that you see there's definitely a trend upward. The blue are the insured losses, so there's also a trend upward in the insured losses. And again, it's about a third of the overall total losses. So there's a trend that's happening there. Oh, and this graph didn't come out at all. Sorry about that. But these are the number of deaths from hazards, from um, all, all natural disasters from 1980 on the far left to 2017 on the far right. What you'll see, actually, this goes back all the way to 1900, this graph, if you could see it. And there are huge amounts of uh, fatalities from events into the millions up here, whereas on the right-hand side of the curve, we just don't see those fatalities from these um, events happening in recent years. We had a lot of fatalities in the Indonesian uh, earthquake and tsunami in 2004. There were quite a few fatalities in the Haitian earthquake in 2010, but those were down here compared to droughts and flood events that killed millions of people in the early 1900s. So our loss events are going up, our losses from events are going up in a trend. Deaths from these events tend to be getting lower, but that punctuated maybe by a few uh, pretty serious events that happen that cause quite a few fatalities, but certainly not what we saw in the early part of the 20th century. This is just another representation of that previous slide. The size of the circle is the amount of deaths for each type of event, and the events are here on the far left, 1900 to 2017 on the, uh, on the x-axis. And so you can see some flooding events, some epidemics, and some drought events creating lots of big fatalities in the early first half of the 20th century, but fewer fatalities from these type of events in the second half of the 20th century and early part of the 21st century. And then this chart here are the, if you look just at the US and you look at what is classified as a billion dollar disaster in the US, so NOAA, keeps track of these billion dollar disasters from 1980 to 2017, so that uh, 37 year period. And during those 37 years, we've had 219 billion dollar disasters of some kind or another in the US. Uh, the largest number is severe storms at 91 tropical cyclones at 38, and, and so forth. The losses are here in this column, and we've had over a trillion, $1.5 trillion in losses from these events since 1980. And then deaths is in the far right corner, less than 10,000 deaths since 1980. So our losses are going up, but we seem to be handling the deaths. We're getting information out that maybe is reducing our fatalities from some of these events, but we're certainly not reducing our losses to these events. Um, in terms of fatalities, ooh, drought and tropical cyclone are the top. What's included in the drought total are heat-related deaths, and uh, heat actually is the lead uh, fatality in terms of a weather type of fatality in the United States. 
And then this is another graph that's just showing the number of billion dollar disasters by year from 1980 on the left to 2017 on the right. And you can see there's a trend up. The colors represent the different types of the disasters. But there were two, three, four in the early 1980s. We're now at uh, 10 to 15 to 16 in uh, 2017 in the United States. Yes. So, and these are number of events in the colors. If you can see, it's very hard, but this line here is the economic loss from these events, and the white is here, and that is adjusted to 2015 numbers. The green is the worst ones, but remember those are the most numerous of the natural disaster events, and so there seems to be more of those happening in recent years. Severe storms would be tornado events like that. So this slide here just shows 2017 and the uh, $16 billion disasters we had in 2017 and their locations. So the three hurricanes down here, the wildfires in the west, but we had some tornado outbreaks, some severe storms and, and hail. There was a freeze damage in Georgia in 2017. So this is what totaled up to those $16 billion disasters. This is another of this, it's the same information. So another depiction of it, the size of the circle represents the actual loss amount. And so you're dominated by Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Maria, um, just billions of dollars in losses, 10 billion for the Northern California file, fires. So those are really the, the big four events that happened in 2017 in the US. And then this is another chart similar to the one you couldn't see before. This is fatality rates of these different hazards. These are the different hazards from 1900 to 2017. And you can see that there's just a downward trend in fatalities of all of these hazards, but they're punctuated by specific events. And you can't see it over here, but the y-axis is actually deaths per million people. So as the population grows, that's factored into this as well. But our death rate per million people of all these hazards tends to be getting less punctuated by these big events. This one is the Chicago heat wave in 1995, Hurricane Katrina in 2004, and the tornado outbreak in Alabama in 2011 are the big recent um, fatality events in the US. So on one hand, we're doing well in terms of reducing the number of fatalities to these events in the US but our economic losses to these events are growing. And I won't have Sharad go to this, but this was a graphic that what I was gonna do was show that depicts Harvey, Irma, Maria, and the wildfires all in one graphic. It was a movie clip, so you can go after, um, after the presentation and you can go look for this. And what you would see is the combination of the hurricanes with the smoke from the wildfires together all in one depiction. And it's pretty interesting. And one point that I would make based on this video is that our ability to track and measure these things is so much better now than what it was 10, 15, 20 years ago that now we are able to put together a video like this that just shows the aerosols associated with the hurricanes and with the fires. And so you can depict it all on one graphic and it really gives a great visualization of what we experienced during the 2017 season. So let's talk a moment about Hurricane Harvey. 
And this picture that I show up here, to me, it almost looks like this is a normal picture. If you look at this, there are people walking, well, boating up and down the street in Houston. Uh, maybe this will be our normal <laughs> one day, but it's just odd to me how normal it looks when you realize how abnormal it actually was. At least that's how the picture strikes me. So the information I get on Hurricane Harvey comes from a set or a series of articles that the Houston Chronicle put together in December um, after Hurricane Harvey had hit Houston. And what they found was that the Houston metropolitan area is 6.6 .6 million. It's the fourth largest in the US. There are 22 different watersheds that go across the metropolitan area. It's about 50 feet above sea level. So there's not much relief across the city of Houston, and therein is one of the problems. This, the article talked about Houston's economic plan, and that was abundant, cheap housing and lax regulation. Nearly one-third of Houston's homes are in a floodplain. The two dams west of Houston are on the list of the country's most dangerous dams. They rank sixth in terms of most dangerous on a list of 700 dams across the country, extremely high risk. So the Corps of Engineers had to, with this knowledge in mind, had to balance how much water they hold back and put those dams under pressure versus how much water they released and caused flooding downstream. This was the conundrum that the Corps of Engineers was under. They've been under these situations before, right? Think of 2011 and the flood in the Missouri River Basin. How much water do you let go? How much water do you keep back? Very tough position to be in the Army Corps of Engineers. Thousands of homes within the reservoir flood pool, so behind the dams, that normally didn't have water, but the dams were designed to hold back that water, and so these homes were actually in that flood pool. And the paper asked, how did they get the permission to build there? Well, I think you all know how they got the permission to build there. Nobody stopped them or the developers from building there. The article went on. Harvey dropped 34 to 60 inches of rain in four days. The, I think the annual precipitation average in Houston is about 55 inches a year. So this is a year's amount of rain in, in four days, trillions of gallons. At one point, it was raining 6.6 .6 inches an hour. Thousands of people started calling 911. They had over 120,000 calls in five days. 7,800 of those calls were from residents needing rescue from high water. And over the storm, 68,000 homes flooded. And I love that last point. The US Army Corps of Engineers is being sued by over 1,000 plaintiffs. So you can't win. You're either sued because you held back too much water, or you're, you're sued because you let too much water go. So we'll, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out uh, in the year or several to come. Let's talk a little bit about Hurricane Maria. This is a picture of um, Puerto Rico. The red dot there is where this picture is taken. This picture comes from the Weather Service in San Juan. And so this idea that the vegetation just gets stripped or was stripped in these uh, hurricanes is, is visible in this picture. So let me show you a satellite view of um, Barbuda after Hurricane Irma. So on the right, this is an August picture of Barbuda, nice and green. September 8th, picture of Barbuda, all browns, no vegetation at all on, on the island. 
So these hurricanes that we had were extremely destructive in the Caribbean. We think of some of these as being US events, but they were Caribbean events as well. Let's go back to Maria. So here's Puerto Rico. The areas in red were um, flash flooding area. So remember that picture I showed you before was down here? So this was wind damage. This area is getting flood damage. Here's a picture of what the flash flooding looked like in where that red spot is. These are landslides. So landslides from east to west across the central part of the island. It's high and rugged, yes. And so here's what a picture of that landslide or some damage from landslides where that red is. And then here's a picture from the west side of the island from flooding probably from uh, the ocean. And so the point here is here, here, across the interior, west side of the island, either it was wind, flooding, uh, landslides, the ocean, Puerto Rico was getting it from all different sides. And you wonder why there's still places where they don't have power in Puerto Rico even today. So an amazing event. So let's switch to another challenge. So this is the bad news. We'll get to the good news here soon. But climate change will switch or will transition from natural disasters to climate change. Climate change has been described as kind of like a disaster in slow motion. And the World Bank used um, that same description to talk about droughts. So droughts are misery in slow motion. So think about that. Uh, sunny day after sunny day, it uh, takes a long time for a drought to evolve. Same with climate change. So climate change is a lot like drought, slow onset, it's a creeping phenomenon, and oftentimes people don't realize that they are in a drought when it's occurring. Same with climate change. Sometimes people don't realize they're in climate change when it's happening, and it can be just as emotional. The sign, no water, no life, comes from the Klamath Basin in Oregon during a severe drought in 2001. You can imagine the emotions that are evolved when municipalities are arguing with farmers who are arguing with environmentalists, who are arguing with tribes. It's all about a limited resource of water. Climate change is probably gonna be a lot like that as we go forward, right? So this is the most recent data from a report that came out just in November 2017 from the US Global Change Research Program. It shows global temperatures and the anomalies from the 1901 to 1960 average, which would be right here, and it goes from 1880 to 2017 or 2016, and you can see that the anomalies are such that we're approaching almost two degrees Fahrenheit above that 1901 to 1960 average as we get here in the uh, mid-2010s. Uh, here. So this is the latest data on uh, the warming temperatures, and this is both land and ocean put together. So what I ask my students is, you know, you can look at this, and it's quite impersonal. I mean, it's just a graph with blues and reds on it, but what does it mean? What, how do you give it more meaning? And you you realize that there are a lot of, climate change is very complex, so there are a lot of intricacies that go into building this graphic. What are the seasonal changes? What are the regional changes taking place? And so one way to kind of make it a little bit more visual is showing how those temperatures are changing around the globe. So this is the same information surface temperature change from that 1901 to 1960 average, and it's a sp on a spatial representation of the globe. You can see northern latitudes 
are changing faster than some of the mid-latitudes with pockets various places. This is what was told to us 20, 30 years ago that the upper latitudes would change faster than the lower latitudes. That's what the models would show. What's also interesting is there are a few pockets where things aren't changing quite as rapidly, including the eastern United States. We just aren't seeing the changes, the warming temperatures in the eastern United States. And so it's kind of like that slide I showed you a couple slides ago. You might not realize that you're in climate change if things aren't really changing in your location. And for the eastern United States, that's definitely true. This slide here, let's see if you can see everything on it. It's changes of uh, northern hemisphere temperature. This time, this line is the 1961 to 90 average. The reds are the instrumental record. So uh, right here, these are the increases in temperature and the instrumental record. And then the black line is the paleoclimate record that goes back to uh, about 300 CE. And you can see the medieval warm period is in the center part of the graphic. The little ice age is uh, in this region. And the point to make is we're getting a lot better at building these chronologies back in time so that we can have more confidence that what we've seen in the recent past is, is getting more accurate because we've, we're doing better with proxies and, and different types of data sets that can be put together to build back our past record. It's important for us to understand the past in order to know what we're facing as we go forward in the future. And then this slide here is a representation of observations versus models. And so from 1880 here on the left to 2016 on the right, it's the change in temperature from the 1901 to 1960 average. The black line on there is a data set that NOAA has put together of global temperatures. The blue line is another data set that was, has been put together of temperatures observed. The red line is another data set that's been put together of observed temperatures. And you see how the black, red, and blue kind of go along together. The orange are the models that have been put together. And you can see how the orange track really well with the red, the blue, and the black lines. And so the models are doing a really good job of capturing the various trends. You can't see it very well, but there is a, um, a yellow kind of a, a sleeve around that showing a little bit of the uh, uncertainty with the models, but it's also tracking the same direction. So as we build back the past and we're getting better, we can use that information into the models and we can get the models so that they're recreating our recent past pretty well. And that gives us confidence as to what the models will show going forward. This slide here is the same thing, same set of observed information in the blue, red, and black lines. But this dark blue are the same models, but only showing natural forcings. So this would be volcanoes, uh, the solar uh, cycle, solar changes uh, coming from the sun. And what you see is that the natural cycles split from the observed at about 1980, 1970. And um, it's an indication that the models, what they capture as in terms of natural forcings, do not mimic what the observed forcings or what the observed record is. So when you put the natural forcings together with human forcings 
and you put those together, you get the model that was shown in the previous slide. This is a, a graph showing reconstructed sea level rise. So we're getting better at putting together records of things like sea level. And here's the recent record here. So sea level is going up. And here's a slide showing uh, sea ice extent in the Arctic from 1980 to 2016. So there is a decrease in sea ice. And if you've been following the news, you'll know that even in the winter time this year in 28, 2018, the winter, the sea ice in the Arctic is at a record low for winter time sea ice. So that's kind of the bad news. And one of the things in the brochure that goes along with this winter lecture series is the question, have people overemphasized the negatives? like these hazards that we've had, like climate change. And I guess I would respond, we haven't necessarily overemphasized them, but we do, it is important to focus on the signs of hope that we have. And I've hinted at some of the signs of hope uh, in some of the previous slides, but I'm gonna now go through and uh, show what some of those signs of hope are for us. Just this week, a set of 250 elected officials from around the country came out with a proclamation that this country needs to be more flood ready um, in terms of protecting ourselves for future flood events. How do we do that? They're saying we need better building codes, we need better natural flow um, areas for rivers to gather and pool when there is flood events. And uh, so these types of things were included in this proclamation. There were uh, officials from every state in the country. Nebraska had one official that signed this proclamation. Do you guys have any idea who that might have been? No. It was Senator Pansing Brooks, State Senator Pansing Brooks. So yeah, I think that's so she was our Nebraska representative on this proclamation. But I'd say this is really good news. It's getting the idea out that we can be better prepared for some of these disasters and hopefully reduce those losses that I showed you in some of those slides earlier. We've got to be better prepared so that we can take steps to reduce those losses to future hazard events. This was an idea that Gilbert White came up with in 1945. Gilbert White was a famous ge uh, geographer, and his dissertation from the University of Chicago talked about how we ne needed to be better prepared as a nation for flooding events. Well, we're only 70 to 80 years after that dissertation, but he'd be very proud that we're making some progress in terms of that. It just takes 80 to 80 years to do this. <laughs> um, he said, floods are acts of God, but flood losses are largely acts of man because of what we do to the rivers, where we build, how we uh, put structures, and that's what's creating a lot of the losses that we have in this country. And that was in 1945. How about some of the other hazards? Let's think about drought for a moment. Um, this is the percent of the U.S. in severe to extreme drought from 1895 on that left-hand part of the curve to 2017 on the right. And you see drought's a normal part of climate in the U.S. There's almost no year where drought's not occurring somewhere in the U.S. And the big droughts stand out, certainly uh, 1934, uh, the 50s drought, uh, 60s was a big drought episode in the eastern United States. Um, 88, 2002, here's the 2012 drought, when, which was almost as bad as the 1950s drought. But right here in the 70s, 76, 77, there was a big drought in the western U.S. And right about that time, Don Wilhite came to the University of Nebraska, and he did a post-drought assessment on how the U.S. government did 
in dealing with the 1976-77 drought. So first of all, this is a picture of Lake Shasta in that drought in 1976-77. Looks very similar to the pictures we saw in the, just the recent drought that we had in, in California. And so one of the things Don realized in his research is we have a problem in this country, and that is the hydroelogical cycle. Maybe you guys have heard of the hydrological cycle, but this is the hydroelogical circle, cycle. You've got drought, but you don't realize you're in a drought because it's that creeping phenomenon. You become aware and then concerned when you have impacts, and then you panic. But when you're in a panic, nobody responds properly in a panic, right? You don't do things in an efficient, timely manner. The rains return. We forget all about the drought. And that makes us apathetic, and it sets the stage for this to happen over and over and over again. This was how we were dealing with droughts in the United States, and this was what Don uncovered. So he was, uh, had a lot of foresight to come up with this idea. Think about it for a moment. Isn't this kind of how we deal with other disasters and maybe even climate change too? And we don't want to be in that panic situation when climate change might become serious down the road. So Don came to Nebraska. He led this research. In 1995, he founded the National Drought Mitigation Center. And one of the things he said in 1985 is government should prepare for droughts by developing and implementing strategies and plans that reduce associated impacts. That was 1985. So if we use the same Gilbert White timeline, maybe in about 2050 we'll be handling droughts on a better. <laughs> no, hopefully not. Hopefully not. And because of part of that reason is the National Drought Mitigation Center. So Mark Sabota is now the director of the National Drought Mitigation Center. Their mission is to really reduce societal vulnerability to droughts by promoting planning ahead and appropriate risk management strategies. So monitoring, very important, awareness, uh, drought policy and planning, and then operational tools are a big part of the National Drought Mitigation Center activities. Still based here in, in at the University of Nebraska, still going strong, still a model for the globe, countries around the globe are working with the National Drought Mitigation Center to improve drought monitoring and drought management in their locations as well. Peter mentioned the US Drought Monitor Map. So this is a weekly assessment of drought conditions. One of the bright spots, one of the signs of hope is that this map has been coming out on a weekly basis since uh, 1999. Um, this is the current map that was released this week. Nebraska not doing too bad, unless you look to the north. This is a remnant of a severe drought last year in the Dakotas and Montana. They still have some dryness and drought conditions up there. And then if you look to the south of Nebraska, there's pretty serious drought and dryness that's developed since October across Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. In fact, that part of Oklahoma here, this is a brown color. It's a D4 drought. It's an exceptional drought. That drought has rapidly evolved. Uh, it's a winter wheat area there in western Oklahoma, and their winter wheat is just uh, pretty much completely died, and they, there's very little hope for the winter wheat crop in western Oklahoma. We have to keep our eyes on this dryness to our south, because when it's dry, their soils are dry, and there's not a lot of moisture that can be evacuated into the atmosphere from these dry areas to our south. That could potentially be an issue for us going forward in, in the summer in Nebraska. But this is an important product. People use it on a weekly basis. The media uses it. And now USDA uses it for a lot of relief decisions that they make for agricultural producers around the country. What I like to say, though, in describing this uh, drought monitor map, is this really makes great use of a convergence of evidence approach. And this is a, what I would advocate is an important approach for all of us to take on various controversial, difficult, complex issues, is we really need to start 
bringing evidence together, and it's with that convergence of evidence that helps us to uh, make decisions and understand uh, where we are in this world, on this blue marble, and to hopefully go forward and, and improve things uh, on, on the earth. So I'll, I'll come back to that con con convergence of evidence approach idea. Another sign of hope is, I mentioned how the National Drought Mitigation Center is infecting itself around the world. Well, the United Nations now has a program called the Integrated Drought Management Program, really designed on uh, Don Wilhite's ideas that he brought into the National Drought Mitigation Center. And successful drought policy that they promote at nations around the world include monitoring early warning, vulnerability and impact assessment, and mitigation and response. Three pillars that you see as a part of the National Drought Mitigation Center's mission are now being promoted by the United Nations on a global scale. The fourth national climate assessment, I, I think, is a sign of hope. The Global Change Research Act was enacted by Congress in 1990, and part of that act was that the U.S. would produce a national climate assessment for the President and Congress every four years. Since 1990, we've had four, well, three reports in 2000, 2009, 2014, but another report is in progress. 2018, and it will be released in December of 2018. What's best about this whole uh, national climate assessment is the process that takes place to develop this report, and I'll talk about that. Um, the process includes reports such as an EPA technical report, that came out in May 2017, so in this last year, 90 contributors to that report. It covered six sectors, looking at the economic impacts of climate change, health, infrastructure, electricity, water resources, agriculture, and ecosystem. So this was a first component of that national climate assessment process. This report gets the prize for the worst front cover that is not the issue of the screen or the projector. There is actually nothing in this area. <laughs> so I don't know if it's a statement from the EPA as to their value of this report at the time, but uh, uh, the report itself is an uh, excellent report. Then in November, the Climate, climate Science Special Report was released. It's considered to be volume one of the 2018 National Climate Assessment, but it was released in 2017. Work on this report began in 2015. It has 32 authors. If you go through this report, there are maybe 15 chapters. Each chapter is followed by a list of references. If you total up the references used to produce this report, there are over 1,900 references as part of that report. Now, some of those are probably repeated in multiple chapters, but when you go through and you look at these references, many of them have five authors, 10 authors, maybe more than 10 authors. So if you put that together, this is a tremendous scientific resource that has come together to work on this uh, this report, the Climate Science Special Report. And it underwent a six-step review process. That all leads to volume two, which is the Climate Change Impact Risk Adaptation in the United States Report that will come out in December 2018. More than 300 authors are part of that report, including myself and the state climatologist at Nebraska, Martha Sholsky. That report covers 10 regions, 15 sectors, and various national topics. I did not put a cover on that because who knows what kind of cover it will be. Maybe it would be like the EPA cover, maybe it would be like the other, other cover. 
But it is kind of amazing that the EPA report, that climate science special report, came out with this administration, and that this report is moving forward with this administration and will be released in December 2018. I think these are signs of hope. This is the, the regions of the climate assessment. So the new regions in this climate assessment that did not exist in the previous one are the Caribbean, which I think is really important given Maria, Irma, and uh, Harvey. And then the Northern Great Plains was not a section before. So this is the chapter that Mark Bischolsky and I are co-authored on. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. But I'll make the same point on this slide. And that is, another sign of hope is that the modeling improvements that have been made since the 1960s have been tremendous. And so now the models going into reports like the National Climate Assessment include all the complexity, or many of the complexities, of the climate system that exists today. So all of these different connections are now included within the models to help make projections of what the future is going to look like. Back in the 1960s, 1970s, this complexity could not have been matched by the models, but now it's being brought into the models. What's interesting is you have uh, results from the models in those earlier years, and they tend to be getting reinforced in the outputs that are coming out in the models uh, that are have this complexity now that go into uh, a report like the National Climate Assessment. I think that's a sign of hope. Another sign of hope is that we're getting a lot better at detection of various uh, climate events and attribution. Attribution is determining the cause of what has uh, led to those climate events. And it's become a very big topic of research uh, in the US. And um, I have here, just to kind of prove that point, this is a complete report that NOAA had, well, actually, it's the American Meteorological Society, put out on just examining what were the attributions to the various events that occurred in 2016. So we are now able to go back and say, what were the causes of uh, say Hurricane Hart, or Hurricane Irma, or the wildfires in California. And that's something that we weren't able to do, say, 10 years ago. That's a sign of hope. Similarly, we've made so much progress in terms of forecasting and outlook capabilities um, in recent years. This is at all time scales. When you think about it, even the daily forecast has improved in the last 10 years, if you think about the forecast for the rain that we're having right now. Think about the forecast for the extreme events that we've had recently. Did you track the forecast of Hurricane Harvey and how they had it forecast to come into Texas and stall for several days? Um, even Hurricane Irma, if you were watching that, was it going to hit Key West? Or was it going to turn slightly before Key West and go up the east side of Florida or go up the west side of Florida? Our forecasts of these things have improved uh, tremendously with time, and I only see that including to uh, improve going forward. We understand things like El Nino and La Nina better. We put a lot of effort into seasonal or sub-seasonal to seasonal forecasts. This is that period between 10 days and 30 days where a lot of decision makers want that information for making decisions. That tended to be kind of a hole in our forecast capabilities. But we're now spending a lot of money in trying to research improving our 10 to 30 day forecasts. So, and the interactions that we're including to make those forecasts. These are signs of hope. Another sign of hope, Nebraska, the university has just put out a couple of reports on understanding climate change for the state. That was a 2014 report. Various uh, sectors and the impacts of climate change on those sectors, a 2015 report. There was an Arctic workshop held at the university in 2016. So 
So these reports are out, and I think it's a sign of hope that the university here in Nebraska is willing to support this kind of research. Here's another convergence of evidence as a sign of hope. In 1956, Gustav Rossby was on the cover of Time magazine, and he's a meteorologist, and he said, another atmospheric variable is carbon dioxide. There's a good possibility that man's fires and engines are adding so much to the, of it to the atmosphere that the world's climate may be changed. That was back in 1956. So we are now bringing forward lots of different evidence to support what Rossby said in 1956. I think that's a sign of hope, and I think we're making tremendous progress. On the scale of, uh, with Gilbert White, he's about 10 years after Gilbert White, maybe in about 10 more years we'll be really strong on the climate change issue. Another sign of hope, our convergence of evidence, we're, we're getting much better at understanding that risk management, doing things before a disaster occurs, before a hazard event, will reduce our impact to those events. And I think people are beginning to understand that risk management is very important, and that convergence of evidence of the value of risk management is a sign of hope. So this is a summary of the signs of hope. I really identified eight of them. Proactive flood management, drought management, the national climate assessment process for modeling capabilities, detection, attribution, forecasting, Nebraska and the legacies that Nebraska has, I think they're a sign of hope. And then this whole concept of convergence of evidence, whether it's disasters, climate change, um, I think it's a sign of hope. So with that, it makes me wonder what David would have thought if he had looked at this picture of the blue marble. And he wrote in Psalms, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hand. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Again, Psalm 19. So I don't know if David had this image in mind when he wrote that, but it certainly fits. And I think it adds to this convergence of evidence that we all need to bring into our minds as we look at this picture and think about the world and the fragile nature of the world and then hopefully build on the good things that are happening here on Earth to help us to go forward into the future. And with that, um, I would like to thank you guys for being a great audience. Thank you, Mike. This is the time where it's a quarter after eight. Let's take about 10 minutes. The refreshments are in the room right behind us. Uh, and then let's come back and we'll have about a half an hour for questions and answers and comments. Thank you. And uh, you might want to stop by those desks that Dick mentioned at the beginning uh, and look at the, uh, the conservation materials.
I will.